All right, welcome everybody. This is uh, our third deep dive webinar for the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation. Uh, today we have the pleasure, it's gonna be a lot of fun and we're gonna learn a lot um, of having Patrick Verms. He's the Senior Science Advisor for the World Agroforestry Center. And he's also on the Advisory Council for the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation. How are you doing today, Patrick? I'm doing absolutely great. It's a lovely evening here in Western Europe, and I hope it's just as nice as it is over where you guys are. It's a, it's a lovely uh, late morning in Southwest Oregon here, yeah. All right, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm keeping coffee, having coffee to keep awake, and I guess you're having coffee to wake up, so. Yeah, well, I had my coffee, I'm just staying hydrated. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. So, shall I start? I, th I think so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Timothy, um, and thanks for the introduction. Now, guys, what I'm going to do today is give you some introduction to something which I think is really the most important thing since sliced bread, which is an understanding of how to manage landscapes by taking all of the elements into account, which is agroforestry, and how that illustrates the principle of intelligence collaborating, and I'll be talking a little bit further about that as well. So, but before I start, maybe it's useful if I um, uh, uh, explain who it is we are. Uh, we are a research center, and th there's 15 of these things around the world. They're called the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, and we are the one that looks at agroforestry systems, and we've got brothers and sisters that do all sorts of things. You may have heard and indeed hated some of our uh, 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 cousins, like the International Rice Research Institute, which uh, uh, engineered the Golden Rice, or CIMIT, where Norman Borlau, uh, the father of the Green Revolution, used to work. All of these are CG centers. Now, we, we've got about 550 scientists and other staff, and we look at the role of trees in agricultural landscapes. And we use this research to uh, advance policies and practices that benefit the poor and the environment. And what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that when we look at things, we always look at them from the perspective of livelihoods, economics, profitability. Why? Because you cannot convince a land owner or a land manager, be it a rancher or a farmer or a forester or somebody else, to do something that goes against their economic interest. It's got to help their livelihoods be successful. Only after you've guaranteed that can you move on to the next thing, which is to ensure that all of this becomes also ecologically perspective, that these land use patterns are patterns that make sense from an economic and an ecological perspective. And there's a reason why we need to do that. And that's because agriculture, looked at broadly, is an absolute disaster. It's one third of global emissions, it's 50% of global employment, it's two thirds of global land use, and it's three quarters of global freshwater use. It's a giant consumer of resources and a massive source of pollution, but it's a rounding error when it comes to the economy. There's something wrong there, and that's what we have to fix. Now, the reason we have to fix it is pretty obvious if you're interested in land. Degradation is a universal issue, and it's not just an issue in these places, which we picture as being like this, Niger in the 1980s, where the land has been so exhausted that nothing can grow on it anymore, but also in these places, in the American Midwest, in the Black Earth of Ukraine, in the Brazilian Cerrado, all places on which the globe now depends to generate the very limited number of crops that it needs to feed itself, and that are being subjected to the best that modern industrial agricultural technology can provide these places are just as much at risk of land degradation as the poor countries of the African Sahel where people are merely trying to survive. And to make life even a little bit more difficult, this is not even the best that we can do. Within 30 years or so, we've got to more or less double the amount of available food, right? Now you could argue whether we need to add 30% or 80% of it, whether you get better at saving food before it rots and putting it on people's plates, or whether you get better at training consumers to eat the food they buy instead of putting it in the bin. But by and large, the consensus seems to be that we've got to double world food production within 30 years. Now you've got to do that while the planet is changing and changing more rapidly than it has changed in millions of years. So you've got to make the entire system more resistant to extreme weathers, and by the way, remember that 30% of emissions? Well, it would be great if we could reduce that as well. 
Now, and you have to do all that in a context in which certain things just aren't changing. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa, the place which still has the fastest population growth rate in the world, the place that is, has one country, Nigeria, that is only three times the size of France, but it's going to have more people than China or India by the end of this century if nothing changes. Well, that place has not seen any increases in its cereal yields. And that is because people don't know what to do. The population is rising really rapidly. Most of them are smallholder farmers. The old time practices they use like following, they cannot use anymore because you know, it's easy when they have a small village and a lot of land, you leave a piece of land to rest for 20 years, you come back, it's great. But when everything is, uh, is peopled, and in the Sahel, the population density in some areas is as high as it is in Holland, then you've got to farm the same soil every single year. And so your fertility is dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. So where are you going to get that from? Well, industry tells you that this is going to be the solution. Fertilizers, bags of this stuff. Yeah, well, you know, African soils are exhausted soils. Exhausted soils tend to be very acidic soils. Here's an example from Zambia. That's a soil map of Zambia, and it shows you how acidic Zambian soils are. Now, the agriculturalists amongst you will know that as soils become more acidic, plants have a greater difficulty in picking up nutrients from that soil, and here is where the majority of Zambian soils are. They are so acidic that apart from iron, almost nothing gets picked up. You put fertilizer on that soil, you might as well burn money in a barrel. It's got about the same effect. So what could you do? You could do what the Brazilians have done. Yippee, let's lime the shit out of that soil and correct the pH and put lots of fertilizer in and have vast machines and farms the sizes of small countries and we can feed the world. Yeah, right. This is Zambia. These are every single metalled roads outside of the cities in a country which is absolutely huge. What do the other roads look like? Well, they tend to look like this. Good luck getting a truck with fertilizer or lime across that. The costs of getting inputs to farms is horrendous. And by the way, the cost of getting farm produce to the cities is horrendous as well, which is why in Lusaka supermarkets, you find South African tomatoes rather than tomatoes grown in Zambia 50 kilometers away. And this problem is compounded by the fact that the African continent is absolutely humongous. It's the size of China, the US, Europe, and India put together. The United States, the most powerful country on earth, is just the size of West African Sahel. It's an enormous continent. So where is that fertility going to come from in the end? Well, it's going to come from trees. And trees do it in all sorts of ways. In the left, you have a system in Ethiopia. It's an acacia called Cladherbia albida and a cereal crop called teff. On the right, you have a multi-cropping system in Sumatra with rubber trees and bananas and coffee and cacao. And there's some maize and there's some rice and there's timber trees and there's honey and there's pepper vines and cardamom and all sorts of things growing in there. And farmers have known this for a long time. Now with remote sensing, you can do things like this. You can measure where are the trees on farms and remove all the trees that grow in forests. And if you look at that map, you notice a pattern and keep that pattern in your mind as I switch to the next slide. This is a slide that shows human population densities and this is the slide that shows trees on farm. They are always together. Wherever there are trees on farms, there are people or wherever you have people, you have trees on farms. And indeed, the amount of trees on farms is increasing the better we look. This is a study we published in Nature last year and it shows that 43% of all agricultural land globally has at least 10% tree cover. 43%, almost half of the land on the planet is already agroforestry in one way or another. And the reason for that is simple. It's because trees work. You don't just plant them like a forester would and then wait 30 years to cut them down and sell the timber. You put them to work long before you do that. Here's an example of the kind of work they do. This is also data from Zambia. And what you see in blue is conservation agriculture with a fertilizer tree, a leguminous tree that fixes nitrogen, called glitosidia. And what you see in red is conservation agriculture without any trees at all, uh, but with fertilizer. And what you see in green is conservation agriculture without trees and without fertilizer. And it's on different soil types in Zambia. And what you see is that on most soil types, the trees are doing as well as the fertilizer and always much better than no fertilizer. 
And these effects you see everywhere, which is why agroforestry is universal. You see it in temperate zones, you see it in arid zones, in humid zones, you even see it in the Arctic. You see it in Central America in coffee systems with timber. If you ever fly from Europe to India, you will spend hours gazing at this kind of landscape. These are windbreaks uh, established by the Soviet Union around these large fields. If you are somebody who likes to pamper yourself, perhaps you have shea butter products in your bathroom. Well, this is the kind of landscape that the shea butter comes from. It's an agroforestry system with those shea trees under which you're growing cereals and then you have the animals eat the stover. Here, this gentleman in Uganda, he's growing bananas, he's growing coffee, and what you see in the foreground is vanilla pods growing on very heavily pruned latrofa, another agroforestry system. Here is Europe's biggest agroforestry system. It's reindeer herding in the far north. And here is my favorite all palm plantation of all times. It's one we're running in Brazil, and I can guarantee you that there's oil palm in there. You can see a few palms in there, but there's so much else going on there. And that system alone produces almost twice as much oil as a monocrop oil palm plantation, plus everything else that's happening in there. It also happens in industrialized systems. This picture was taken in France, and what you have there is poplars growing together with wheat. Or you have these really complex systems that are humid tropic systems. You have them in Indonesia, in Central Africa, in the Amazon. And these systems are so extraordinarily complicated and look so strange to our Western eyes that I can guarantee you could walk straight through them and have no idea you're on a farm, but think you're in a rainforest. And yet they produce a bounty of stuff. And here is, is maybe the most amusing agroforestry system I know. The crop is the coconuts, and the agroforestry component are the glyricidia trees, these heavily coppiced trees you see in the middle. They are very good uh, nitrogen fixers, so what you do is you coppice them, you strip off the leaves and leave them for the coconuts, and you take the branches which you bundle together, and in this particular case, they're being sold to a nearby electricity power plant, which is burning biomass. And if you happen to be a gourmet, then you will enjoy your champagne. These are the cork trees from which the champagne corks come from. And you will perhaps enjoy that with a lovely slice of perfectly aged pata negra ham. And that comes from those pigs who are eating the acorns of those trees. Here, amongst Mount Kilimanjaro, you have complex multistrata gardens with coffees, bananas, cardamoms, and much else. And here in Zambia, you have an industrial, semi, sorry, um, um, yes, an industrial agricultural system using phytherbia, another leguminous tree with, uh, with maize. And in some of the poorest uh, patches of land on earth, like in Niger, what you see is sorghum and millet growing with these phytherbia albedos, that's the green trees you see on there, and fruit trees around the villages. Those are the, the dark red trees you see at the top right of the slide. So everywhere in the world, from the Arctic to the semi-desert, from mountains to plains, from humid areas to dry areas, from rich places to poor places, farmers use trees. Why is that? Patrick, one thing I wanted to tell everybody, we've had a lot of new people come in. I just wanted everybody to start uh, thinking of questions. I wanted to remind everybody and people that just came that at the end, we're going to have a question and answer session like we do for about a half hour. So as you think of questions, you can type them into that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Just, mm -hmm. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure we get no. a lot of good questions. No, no, no worries at all. And I very much look forward to your questions, everybody. And I'm going to look at the Q&A box after the presentation is over. Um, and um, well, I guess I'll just continue from here on. So the question is why? Why, do, why have farmers around the world in different cultures and different environments all come to the conclusion that having trees in your field is a better idea than not having trees in your field? And if you start looking at it, it's pretty obvious. But an obvious thing is trees have deep roots and crops don't have deep roots. So trees can pump nutrients up from deep soil horizons and then make these nutrients available to the crop simply through the natural process of leaf and twig fall. These leaves and twigs land on the soil surface where they mineralize and hey presto, you've got uh, nutrition available for your crop. Another pretty obvious thing is, uh, is uh, water cycle buffering. Um, trees are actually giant rain caching devices. These branches capture all of the incipient rainfall and they root it along the trunk and down into the soil, which has been opened up thanks to the tree roots. And so the water gets stored under the ground. 
where it becomes available later on if there's a dry spell to your crops. It's also a much better system when it comes to the use of sunlight. And you know, science is good, but sometimes takes, science takes a while. The horizontal line here is 40 years long. This experiment was run by French scientists for 40 years, and all they did year in, year out, was to measure one variable, how much sunlight is used by the experimental plot. And on the left, you have an agricultural plot, a wheat plot. In the middle, you have a freshly planted walnut uh, forest. And on the right, you have an agroforestry system combining wheat and walnut. And what you see on the left is that in the agricultural system, about 70 to 75% of the sunlight is wasted because it's a winter crop. So you plant it in late summer and you harvest it in early, late spring. And in practical terms, that means that when it's really, really sunny in Europe, there's nothing growing on your land. The, in the middle, the forest system behaves much as you would expect. So as the seedlings are small, most of the sunlight is wasted, but the trees grow fairly rapidly. And by the time they're about 20 years old, their crowns have fully developed and they are um, absorbing about 60% of the incipient sunlight. They're not absorbing more because it's a deciduous tree. It loses its leaves around October and walnut gets its leaves quite late in the season, um, around May, late May. So a lot of sunlight is wasted there as well. Now look at the right in the agroforestry system and notice that the black area, which shows wasted sunlight over that 40 year period is simply smaller. It wastes less sunlight than either the agriculture or than the forestry system. Trees and crops have learned to get along with each other. The tree influences the crop, the crop influences the tree. How does the crop influence the tree? Well, the most obvious way is that it pushes the tree roots downwards because there's no room close to the surface to send your roots sideways. And what does that mean? Here is another experiment done in France. On the left, there you have a forest, and on the right, you have an agroforest. And what these two charts show is the amount of rootlets by depth. So the vertical axis is depth, uh, so from zero to four meters, and the horizontal axis is the rootlet density. You notice that in the forestry system, your roots are much closer to the surface than in the agroforestry system, which means that when a drought is coming in the forestry system, your tree stops growing. It just can't get the water it needs anymore. Whereas in the agroforestry system, it just goes, hey, hey, I don't care, my roots are down and it keeps on growing. Once you understand that, you understand the giant lie that most industrial agriculture is telling you. Here's an example. Look at that gorgeous picture. It is taken from the website of one of the big ag input sellers. It shows a land of bounty. It's a kind of picture a priest would use in a church to illustrate a story from the Bible. And yet all I see is a temperate zone system in summer when sunlight is 16 hours of the day and in which there's a fair amount of rain and there is no biological activity. There is no photosynthesis anymore. It might as well be a desert. At least here, when you're harvesting your wheat, you still have trees that are going to be synthesizing, photosynthesizing biomass for another three to four months. And because of all of these effects, there is a fundamental concept, a fundamental number, which is always higher than one. And that's the land equivalency ratio. And the land equivalency ratio is simply the amount of monocrop agriculture, the, the green square uh, or rectangle rather, and the amount of monocrop forestry, the orange rectangle, that you need to achieve the same productivity as one unit of agroforestry. And in this fictitious example, the land equivalency ratio is 0 0.6 plus 0 0.8, so 1.4. So you get 40% more productivity from mixing things up than you do if you uh, split them. And the evidence is there. That's a model, but here is a real life example. It's a poplar and winter wheat system. And what you see is in green that the productivity of the trees is going up and in brown that the productivity of the wheat is going down as time progresses and as the tree crowns are hogging more and more of the resources. In blue at the top is the land equivalency ratio year after year. And what you see is that at the end, 
when you're ready to harvest your trees, the land equivalency ratio is 1.34. 34% more productivity simply by mixing things up. In a number of experiments that have been done in walnut trees and winter cereals, where the walnuts are on 40-year rotations, you get land equivalency ratios between 1.4 and 1.6. 40 to 60% more productivity. Now, the last time I checked the website of the input salesman, they were trumpeting productivity increases of 3 or 4 or 5% thanks to their latest seeds or their latest fertilizers. Here, simply by mixing things up, we are getting almost 10 times higher productivity increases. And you know what the most beautiful thing about it is? You don't even need trees. You could even do it with solar panels, as in this system, where you have solar panels on these, uh, uh, on these pylons and you have a vegetable production under it. And that's been measured to have a land equivalency ratio of 1.3 to 1.7. So again, this is an experiment that was done in France. They're quite active. And uh, what is happening there now is that farmers are beginning to twig. And if they're putting the, uh, the panels down, they are adding either animals or horticulture under them. Lots of examples from around the world. Here's an example for one of the poorest plants of the world, Mali. Maize and cowpeas together, boom, 47% higher productivity. This is in uh, Java, intercropping teak and maize. 90% more productivity. Here's my famous Brazilian oil palm production again. That's just the oil in green. In red is the monocrop. And remember, you have everything else as well. Bananas, chai, coffee, and cacao. And here is an example from Malawi. This is not a test. This is simply for measuring farmers' fields. And so what we did was to, the sampling frequency is the number of fields where we measured the yield. And we divided what we measured to four classes. The first is maize without anything, no fertilizer, no trees. And that particular growing season, they got 1.3 tons per hectare. The next line is maize with fertilizers. And first, Malawi has a fertilizer subsidy program, so lots of farmers get free fertilizers, which is why so many fields had some fertilizer on it. And yeah, you get an improvement. It's 1.7 tons, so it's 40%, 400 kg more than if you don't use anything. But compare that to the third line maize with fertilizer trees. No fertilizer, just fertilizer trees. There they got three tons per hectare, almost double what you get with fertilizer. And the clue, because fertilizer is free or cheap, farmers are using it even when they have fertilizer trees, that's the last line, and it's about the same productivity. There's no statistical difference. In practical terms, in that particular agricultural system, Fertilizer is totally useless as long as you have trees, and trees perform much better than fertilizer if you don't have anything. So your choice as a farmer always ought to be to plant some trees. Same thing in France. I'm not going to go through this in detail, except to say that this guy, who was an obstreperous old coot when I met him, um, was uh, a pioneer. And he was a pioneer because in Europe, uh, the common agricultural policy penalized you if you put trees in your fields. So this guy planted his agroforestry system 35 years, well, it's a bit older now, 38 years ago or so, um, at a time when not only did he not get any subsidies, but when he lost subsidies for putting trees in his fields along the principles of, I don't care what Europe tells me. He made plenty of mistakes. The agroforesters amongst you will see that the lines are too close together. His machine is running half on empty when it's going back. The trees have not been pruned properly enough so that the bowl of the tree is too low, so he's losing money that way. But despite all that, when he harvested his crop of walnut, which coincided with him going into retirement, he got himself a nice little bonus of 2 million euros. When I met him, he had a twinkle in his eye, and he asked me one very simple question. Patrick, Ferrari or Lamborghini? Now, that is a nice place to be when you're a farmer. His daughter took over the management of the farm, and she's putting trees on the remaining hectares that have no trees, and of course, replanting here. Here is a less anecdotal and more measured example. It's a uh, um, uh, short rotation copies for bioenergy and rotation, mostly wheat, in the alleys. And here are the results. They have a land equivalency ratio of 1.43. And sometimes, the land equivalency ratio is much, much higher. In this particular case, the land equivalency ratio is actually infinite because in this landscape in the 1980s, nothing could grow. In this environment, you have one rainy season lasting four to six weeks when a lot of water falls. 
and then you have 10 months of daytime temperatures in the 35 to 40 degrees Celsius range without any rainfall at all. You can't grow crops in that environment, it's too harsh, but you can when you have trees. These are these Phytherbia trees. We love them because they have a reverse phenology. They lose their leaves at the beginning of the rainy season, which is why they look gray in this picture. All these lovely little leaves filled with nutrients land on the soil surface and help to grow crops. And today, that region is growing. This is all data. We have fresh data now. Um, it's about 10 million hectares of agroforestry parklands out there now, and it's generating between one and two million tons more cereals than before, including, and I stress this, in drought years. And that's why in the development world, when the great and the good of development look at everything that you could do to improve agricultural productivity, the things that are greatest for production, for resilience, and for mitigation are always things that involve trees. And of course, you get better performance when you have more species. Now, Farmers who do this well always have one thing in common. They are extraordinary scientists. And I'd like to introduce one here, Sebastian Scott. He's a Zambian farmer. He's a white man, as you can see. And he is, uh, uniquely enough, a smallholder. He's got two hectares. And he has spent the last 20 years performing and improving a management system there that involves no inputs and that involves no machinery in order to demonstrate it to other farmers who can apply it to their own thing. And what you see there is this maize. In an environment which normally maize is a small, sickly green, yellowish plant that produces very little. And the reason why it's so productive is because he's mixed it up to a much larger extent. And I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining the way his system works because it's such a beautiful illustration of how you can mix trees, and crops and animals together to achieve enormous productivity gains. So here is his first rotation. He's got three alleys, and the alleys are bounded by pigeon peas. And in the first alley, he's got groundnuts. In the second alley, he's got maize, climbing beans, and pumpkins. And in the third alley, he's got soybeans. And these alleys are quite narrow. The, the space for the crops is only about five to six meters. And there's a reason for that. So he's harvesting from his first rotation, and of course, he's getting maize, beans, pumpkins, soybeans, groundnuts, and pigeon peas. But then is where it gets interesting. This is the only farmer I've ever met who told me that he is managing and protecting his weed seed bank. Yes, you heard me right, his weed seed bank. Because after harvest, he's letting the weeds run riot in those alleys, and then he's sending in his livestock. And the livestock is eating all of those weeds, and it's also stripping the pigeon pea of all of its leaves. And pigeon pea leaves are high in nitrogen, so it's excellent fodder for animals. And at the end of that process, what you end up with is beautifully manured soil without weeds, and with um, empty boughs of, bare boughs of pigeon pea. So in addition to his vegetable products, he of course got some milk and some meat. Now, the second season, what happens? The, he is taking, waiting for the pigeon peas to come into the first flush of their leaves at the beginning of the rainy season. He then coppices the pigeon pea right down to the ground and carries those branches of pigeon pea and lays them down onto the alley where the groundnut was previously growing and where he's now going to grow maize. And that, by the way, is why the alleys are so narrow because poor African smallholders have no machines, so all the labor is done by hand. And if you have to carry all of those freshly cut boughs a long distance, you're not going to do it. But this way, the maximum carrying distance is 10 meters. Why does it put it all onto the land that used to have groundnuts? Because both soybeans and groundnuts are legumes, and if you were to over-fertilize the alleys in which you're going to put your soybeans and your legume, your groundnuts, you're going to get the lazy nodular effect. So it's not much use. But the maize is very hungry, and therefore you put all of the pigeon pea onto your maize. The pigeon pea then grows back your soybeans and your groundnuts and your maize and your climbing beans and so on are growing. Now, with this system, he's getting close to 10 tons of maize per hectare of land and everything else as well. No inputs apart from the animal manure. 
It's pretty extraordinary, wouldn't you say? And that's why we know that agroforestry systems are so productive. Here is an example from Indonesia, from Sumatra. On the left, you have a rubber plantation. It could be any size because it's easy to manage. You need one manager and a bunch of slaves to spray the pesticides. And it could be 1,000 hectares, 5,000 hectares, 10,000 hectares, which is why oligarchs and generals love it, by the way. Easy to manage, easy to program into a spreadsheet. On the right is a Damar agroforest with all of these different things going on. In the middle level, you can see, can I, can I use a? Yeah, you can see it here. This layer is rubber. So you have a lot of rubber going on in there as well, but you have all sorts of other things as well. You've got your bananas, you've got your coffee, you've got your maize, you've got various other things, and you've got your timber trees at the top. Now, what happens when you compare these two? This is a measurement that was done in the early 2010s. Um, the jungle rubber farms have to be small because they're really difficult to manage. So they're typically three to five hectares, whereas the plantations can be very large. The income after the costs for the rubber plantation is about $800 per hectare per year. Why? Because it's a monocrop, so it's very susceptible to disease. So you need to spray, 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 and spraying is expensive. Whereas in the jungle rubber garden, you very rarely have pest problems, so you don't need to spray. On your rubber plantation, you have one thing to sell, rubber. And if the price of rubber crashes, you're stuck. That was a good year for rubber. In the jungle system, you have over 10 different things to sell, and some of them you can eat. So even if the rest of the world goes to the dogs, you're not going to starve. The biodiversity in the rubber plantation, predictably enough, is practically zero compared to that of the forest that it replaced. But in the jungle system, it's about 60% compared to that of the forest that it replaced. Spraying, high in the plantation, low to nil in the jungle system. Social costs, quite high in the rubber plantation because you've kicked all these people off their land. And then the only job they can get is to spray your poison onto your trees. So usually without much protection and much training. So they are poor, they're exposed to nasty chemicals. It's not a nice life. Whereas in the jungle system, you're a master of all your survey. It may only be three hectares, but by God, it's a productive three hectares. And the environmental costs are, of course, very low. And just stop to think what that means. This is, Indonesia is an emerging market. So it's not quite poor anymore, but it's still a country in which ten to $15,000 family income per year is a huge amount of money. And indeed it is. When you walk in those landscapes, what you see is concrete houses with a satellite dish on the roof and a motorbike or sometimes even a car in the driveway. This is real development. It is something that is making people richer and healthier. So you may ask, why doesn't it spread? Well, I already gave you the answer. The rubber plantation is easy to manage if you're an investor living in Jakarta. The jungle Damar garden, you can't manage it. You need to have farmer owners. And 10,000 hectares with one manager is a lot easier to control than 10,000 hectares with 2,000 different farm families on it. By God, they might have demands. They might want democracy. They might want to be masters of their own fate. If you're a good dictator, that's the last thing you want. And that's part of the reason why plantation forestry is so successful in poor countries. It's easier to control, but it's so much less productive. Here's a picture I took in Cameroon. This guy switched over from cacao, full sun cacao, to agroforestry cacao. And on the left is his old house, and on the right is his new house. Guess what he's happy with? Agroforestry. Now, you can even make it work on rented land. Um, this farmer, Stephen Biggs, in Cambridgeshire, has a 15-year tenancy. He's putting apple trees down in between his, uh, his, uh, his wheat. Um, he's doing it mostly for the wind shading effects, so to increase his wheat productivity, but also to get the fruits. And because the timing of uh, the work you have to do on the apples uh, cinches well with the work you have to do on the wheat. And he's getting a land equivalency ratio of 1.1. So still 10% more productivity, even though he's only got 15 years to make his money. So there are two lessons to be had here from all of this wonderful story. The first is that to get good crops, to feed the world, you don't need inputs and you don't need GMOs. Simple agroecological interventions, adding one tree species to one crop species is going to get you half the way there. And advanced agroecology, like what Sebastian Scott was doing in Zambia, is going to get you most of the rest of the way there. 
And yes, you might need some inputs because after all, you're off taking food. That means you're off taking nutrients and sooner or later, you're going to have to replace these nutrients. But by and large, you can get a long, long, long way without using the things that industry tells us are essential. But there's a second lesson there. And the second lesson comes from this gentleman. This gentleman was born in the 1860s and died in the 1940s <clears throat> and is a, a German scientist by the name of Jakob von Uexküll. And when Jakob von Uexküll did, and the big insight he provided to science, was to help us understand that every creature on this planet has a perspective, a way of looking at the world. We humans, we have good eyes, we have language, we have prehensile thumbs, and we have hands. So our perspective of looking at the world depends a lot more on our eyes than it does on our ears, for example. We also depends on the knowledge that language gives us. So what he called our Umwelt is the human Umwelt that we are all familiar with. What agroforesters have learned to do is to understand the Umwelt of this creature, the tree. A tree's umwelt is about the air, it's about the sun, it's about the water, but a lot of it, and perhaps most of it, is about what happens under the ground, what happens in the soil. You don't have a neural system in the way that animals do, and you don't have movement in the way that animals do, but you have ways of communicating with your neighbors, of communicating with other plants, of adapting yourself to your environment, protecting yourself against pest attacks. And you do that in ways that our minds cannot begin to imagine. But yet, with a little bit of sympathy, we can at least see what pleases that creature and what displeases that creature, and that way we can help it thrive. Likewise, in an agroforestry system, the creature crop and the creature tree talk to one another and collaborate with one another. The crop is looking at the world in a very different way from the way the tree is looking at the world. But both of them have a way of looking at the world. And if we understand that way, if we understand their intelligences, if we understand how to marry these intelligences, we get that higher productivity. Now, you may say, what is this guy talking about? How can I imagine myself as a tree? Well, it can be just as hard if you're a mammal. Just imagine yourself as this bat. Your eyes are practically useless. The way you see the world is through echolocation. You send, up, send out a series of high-pitched cries that come back to you even in the dead of night and paint a vivid and extremely precise picture of what's around you. This is good enough so that you can distinguish between different kinds of moths on the wing in the middle of the night and capture the ones that you like to eat and avoid the ones that are poisonous. That's how precise it is. What is it like to have a mind that sees the world that way? I have no idea. Here's another example. This creature is a mole. The way it understands its umwelt is through its nose. These tentacles, shaped like a star, are the things that it uses to taste and explore the soil when it is digging and traveling along its galleries. Its umwelt is an umwelt of touch and of smell and of taste. It includes no sound. It includes no vision, but yet it is rich. And that is what agroforesters do. They try to understand and to work with the umwelt of the creatures that they hope to harness to their needs. But now, moving on a little bit, I would like to tell you, I would like first to ask a question to, um, to Timothy. Um, Timothy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Wonderful. Now, I have a lot more slides divided into a lot more sections, but I'm sure that people are getting tired. The question I have for you is how much time do you think I should um, use to continue? And when should I wrap up? I would say you're just two minutes under halfway if we, if we do a half hour Q&A. So. OK, yeah. that's great, because I'm about halfway through the presentation. I would say go for it all. I say do it, yeah. All right. Does It'll everybody agree with yeah, it'll bring up a lot of good questions too, so yeah. Good. 
So now we've, we've looked at mostly at the fertility impact of trees. And we've tried to understand how trees can be perceived as creatures and how we can understand those trees. Now let's look at something else that trees do. Nutrition. Trees are absolutely fantastic because in addition to giving you the calories that cereals give you, they give you vitamins and proteins and minerals that are sometimes difficult to find in other places. And that's why environments like this are so nutrition. This is in Central America. And this complex system, um, this milpa system with trees, has kept high population densities well fed for centuries. Whereas this system, another picture I picked up from uh, the website of, a, of an input seller, is a picture of disaster. There are no people there, there are no trees, there's absolutely no nutrition. And nutrition is crucial. Part of the reason why Africa is doing so badly is because it has so little access to micronutrients. Stunting is more prevalent there than anywhere else except South Asia. And stunting doesn't just mean that you grow up to be a small person. Stunting also means that you grow up to be a weak person. It also grows up to mean that your mind is working less well, that your cognition is not working as well. In other words, it's setting you up to, for a life of poverty and a life of suffering. Stunting is horrible. And stunting is so easy to fix. All you need to do is ensure that kids by the age of five have received all the nutrients that they need. And what kind of nutrients do they need? Well, in addition to cereals, meat and milk is a pretty good idea. And in those environments, fodder trees are wonderful. This particular uh, species there, this is in Kenya, um, has a nitrogen content which is higher than anything you can buy in a feed bag. So grow these in the margins of your cereal fields and boom, you've got milk for your kids. Another thing that you can do is to look at diversifying your diet. What we did here, this is work that was done by a colleague of mine, was simply to compare what would happen if you actually succeed in getting people to eat golden rice, which was developed by, uh, by the International Rice Research Institute. Well, if you have golden rice, you get much more vitamin A than if you only have white rice. And this is particularly an issue in Southeast Asia, where people eat a lot of rice and where blindness due to vitamin A deficiency is a serious issue. But even with golden rice, you're only getting half the vitamin A you need, and you haven't done anything for all of the other nutrients that are useful for life. Whereas if you add to your white rice a simple fat carrot, you're getting all of the vitamin A you need. And if there's no carrots in your environment, you've got cassava leaves, you've got moringa leaves, red palm oil, butternut or mangoes, that will provide you with the same amount of vitamin A. Now expand it again by adding an orange and boom, you've got your vitamin C covered. And again, there's other things you can do if you have no oranges in your environment. Add a little bit of beef, a tiny bit of beef, 50 grams. That's, uh, what, what is that? That's, uh, let's see, how, many, well, how much is an ounce? It's two ounces, isn't it? It's two ounces of beef, it's nothing. Um, but that's enough to ensure you have the zinc you need and to significantly boost your iron. Add some lentils and some spinach and you're set. So encouraging people to multicrop, to polycrop, to grow lots of different things around their farms is going to be absolutely crucial to beat the curse of stunting. And what kind of fruits, you might ask? Exotic fruits like mangoes or bananas or oranges, which are the same all over the world? No. Indigenous fruits. Indigenous fruits beat exotic fruits hands down on a number of metrics. That first line, and Ansonia digitata is a tree you all know, it's the baobab tree. And the baobab fruit has up to 10 times more vitamin C than an orange. And the same applies to a number of other crops, tree crops in the area. And on top of that, you can harvest them all year round. So all you have to do is to look at the trees that are fruiting during the hunger period, either period when your stores of cereals are running low, but you haven't yet harvested the cereals of your next cropping season, which often corresponds to the time of year when you have to do the most work to prepare your land for the next cropping season. Well, just choose the trees that are producing their fruit during that time, pick the ones that are producing the vitamins and the nutrients you need, and boom, you've got your problem solved. But you might ask, where are people going to get their seedlings from? Where is the germplasm going to come from, even for those native trees, when deforestation is such an issue? And here I'm focusing on West Africa. And the way we do that 
is very simply by teaching farmers how to do what we call participatory domestication. So we teach farmers how to do marketing. We teach them how to do grafting. We teach them how to reproduce trees in seedling beds. We don't do it for them. And the reason we don't do it for them is because in an environment of high scarcity, the one tree in the bush that's producing well and whose fruit has desirable characteristics, it's tasty, it's sweet, it resists disease and so on, you're not going to tell some foreigner who's turning up in your village where it is. It's your secret. Because if people know where the tree is, people are going to go steal the fruit. So you can't do it for them even if you wanted it to. But you can tell them how to grow an orchard. And that's what they then do. They pick the tree that they prefer from their own landscape and they plant orchards from the resulting germplasm. There's other advantages to these, uh, to these orchards. If you travel around Africa, you'll often see people in um, wheelchairs or in locally manufactured equivalents of wheelchairs. And half the time, the reason for that is because they fell out of trees while gathering fruit and they broke their back. In these orchards, the trees are small. You don't have to climb to get the fruit. A natural tree, you may have to wait 15 to 20 years for it to fruit. In these orchards, you can get fruiting after two or three years. So for all of these reasons, those techniques are extraordinarily helpful. And the clue from our perspective is, because we are not giving them germplasm, we are not giving them something developed in a lab far away and telling them plant this, but we're giving them the techniques to domesticate and plant what they themselves say in their landscape. What we are seeing is a rapid improvement of the genetic quality of the trees across the landscape, but with every village having domesticated its own tree. So you improve genetic quality while maintaining genetic diversity. It's a far more resilient way than to try to over-engineer something in a laboratory. And for that reason, in West Africa, people are domesticating over 50 different species, and they are well proud to show you how they're going about their job. Now, that's encouraging. But what's perhaps even more encouraging in a world in which over 70% of the farmers are smallholders and they produce the majority of the food is that betting on small farmers is such a good idea. Look at this chart from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. What they did was to measure the productivity of a range of crops in a range of countries of all of the farms in that country, dividing these farms into four size classes from the smallest quarter of farms in blue to the largest quarter of farms in purple. No matter where you are, no matter what the crop is, the small farms produce more than the big farms, sometimes grotesquely so. Small holders in rice in Nepal commonly get over 15 tons of rice per hectare, whereas large farms barely manage a ton per hectare. And this, by the way, is not just something that happens in poor countries, it's the same in the US. This is all data from 1992, but I would be surprised if it had changed a lot. The smaller the farm, the more your net output, your profit per hectare or per acre, excuse me, um, is. The larger your farm, the lower your output per hectare. Why is this? Because when you're a small farmer, you're in effect a gardener. You know what every plant needs. You know here's disease, you need to cut it out. Here something is wilting, it needs a bit more water. There something is a bit pale, perhaps we can add a bit of manure. Oh, there there's a little bit too much shade, I'll prune the tree. You are managing the land as a gardener would. And so of course it's far more productive. Whereas on these big farms, all you can do is sit in your tractor with your iPod on, drinking a can of Coke and letting the machine do exactly <laughs> the same thing. Heck, acre after acre after acre after acre. Now it turns out that small farms are also the bedrock of development if you would not recognize a farm if you stumbled upon it. This guy, Joe Studwell, is an economist. He is the editor, or was, I don't know if he still has that job, of the China Economic Quarterly. And before that, he was an editor at The Economist magazine. And he wrote what for me is the best book on development economics I've ever read called How Asia Works. And it's simply comparing the development pathways of four successful Asian countries namely Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and China, with four unsuccessful or less successful countries, namely the Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. And I'm going to read this quote, which comes from the review of that book in The Economist, because it is so pertinent to what we're trying to do. 
Asia's post-war miracle economies emerged by following a recipe with those three ingredients, land reform, export-led state-backed manufacturing, and financial repression. What that means, land reform, is you break up the large land holdings and give the land to small landless peasants. Export-led, what does that mean? Well, Taiwan in 1960 was exporting two things that the world wanted, asparagus and mushrooms. And financial repression means you ensure that the money stays locally, there is no free capital movement, and that it's invested locally. The process began with the ousting of the landlords. Feudal estates were broken up and divided among small farmers who also received cheap credit and valuable advice. Notice valuable advice, not fertilizer subsidies, valuable advice. Smallholder farming requires grotesque amounts of labor, but that is a good thing because countries as poor as Taiwan or South Korea were in the 1950s have labor and only labor in abundance. The book shows you that the same mechanism played in the US where immigrants arriving in New York went west to claim their, what was it, 90 acres of land where they started farming? In China, in Germany, in the UK, in Belgium, anywhere in the world that developed followed this recipe. And that is why I'm confident in saying that advice is so much more important than anything else. These smallholder farmers who have two hectares need one thing only, to know how to care for those hectares. What Taiwan did in 1960 was devote 10% of GDP to agricultural extension. It had a university trained extension officer living in every village, not visiting, living in any village and living there for a minimum period of four years, becoming a member of the community and helping the local farmer gardeners become better and better and better at what they did. That's why I'm convinced that this guy, however much I respect what he's trying to do, actually has very little influence on the development of African agriculture. All his billions are trying to go into high-tech solutions and genetically engineered this and precision agriculture that and blah, 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 which makes very little difference to the life of the hundreds of millions of Africans who are smallholders. This guy, however, who to the best of my knowledge has never spent a penny on philanthropy in Africa and who was pictured here having a rather uncomfortable time in front of the US Congress has probably done much more than Bill Gates. Why? Simply through his tools. Look at this group. It's a closed group, small scale farmers farming as a business. It's a Zambian group. In August, it had 320,000 members. Just a couple of hours ago, it had 415,000 members. Zambia, I'll remind you, is one of the poorest countries on earth. And yet over 400,000 small farmers have Facebook accounts and have joined this page where what is most frequently done is asking for advice and giving advice. A typical comment there will be, I have 200 kwacha, that's about $3. I have 200 kwacha to invest. What should I do? And somebody will reply, buy tomato seeds. The market is good in Lusaka right now. And somebody else will say, no, there's already too many tomatoes being grown. Go for cabbage. It's a longer term bet, but it's going to make you more money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's fantastic. Here is data from Niger, from the, re from the uh, Réseau des Chambres d'Agriculture du Niger, the network of agricultural chambers of Niger. And what they are running is a phytosanitary helpline. So you have a problem with your crop, you call them up and they give you advice. Um, the horizontal line is weeks, it's French. So S stands for semaine or week. And uh, it simply records the numbers of calls they are getting per week. First on mobile in blue and on WhatsApp in orange. And the week 52 is the last week of December of last year. And the WhatsApp figure has grown even more now people are using WhatsApp. Why? Niger is so badly run that only 10% of women can read and write. Only 25% of men can read and write. That means that text messaging is pretty useless. It also means that nobody has money. So paying the cost for a voice call is something people can't afford. But WhatsApp, WhatsApp is wonderful. You can send pictures. You can send voice files. 
You can send little movies. You can film your critter and send it to the advisory people who can immediately identify it and tell you what to do, as opposed to the telephone thing where somebody speaks to you and tries to explain what the critter is and you're trying to understand what it is and it takes forever, especially in an environment in which you have dozens of different languages with hundreds of local dialects and where a given bug might have hundreds of different names. So just imagine the difference that that makes. And finally, we know that this is so because the key agroforestry input is not germplasma, it's not machinery, and it's not fertilizer, it's skill. If you are a monocrop farmer and you're doing what the input companies say, you're following the advice on how to manage the seed, on how to fertilize, on how to pesticide use, etc. All the farmers in a given area exposed to the same climate and having the same soil are going to get roughly the same yield. But forestry farmers are going to be spread out a lot more. They're going to be a bunch of geniuses who are going to get a fantastic yield. There's going to be the mass that is getting a yield that is better than the monocrop, but only slightly so, maybe a land equivalency ratio of 1.2 or 1.3. But there's also going to be a significant minority who are going to get a lower yield because they have chosen the wrong tree species. I've seen one example of eucalyptus interplanted with coffee in Uganda, and it was not a pretty sight. Um, because they have planted the trees too close together, because they have not pruned them properly, because of many other factors. Agroforestry demands more skill and more knowledge than monocrop farming does. It demands gardening skills. And that's why this lady is the real future of precision agriculture, not whatever gizmos they manage to put into one of these. Let's now talk about the environmental services that trees provide. As we all know, climate change is coming and it's not going to be pretty. As we may not know, despite the evidence that land is collected to climate, the world has taken a long time in finally deciding to do something about it. Look at the date on this, November 2017, less than a year ago. They finally decided to include agriculture into the, cli the global climate negotiations, despite the fact that the emissions related to agriculture, land use, land use change, and forestry are huge, about a third of total emissions. And I suspect this is probably an underestimate because it does not take into account the change of carbon in agricultural soils, which many of you who are holistic rangers will know is an absolutely massive issue. So what roles tree, do play tree in that? Well. I'm almost embarrassed to say it because it's so banal. If you put more trees in your landscape, you're locking up more carbon. There's more carbon under the ground and there's more carbon above the ground and you can use that biomass to do whatever the hell you like. So the mitigation potential is absolutely huge. This is an example from Europe. It's research that was done in Europe. And they reckon on fairly conservative numbers that if agroforestry was done everywhere where it's suitable in Europe, you could mitigate about 1.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. That's one third of total emissions of the entire European Union from all sources, power, transport, construction, industry, and farming. It's a massive potential. And as already pointed out, um, trees are very present on farm. Now this has been studied in some detail, and if you're interested, there's a whole book that's been devoted to it, um, to try to understand and analyze the carbon sequestration potential of agroforestry system. But to do this, we need to encourage farmers. Farmers are being asked to take a risk when they put down a tree. First, that tree is going to take a while to grow before it provides you with any return. But meanwhile, you've got to put in the labor and the protection and the watering and all the stuff to help that tree get over the first few years of its life. So you have the costs now and the benefits later. These benefits can be uncertain, and not only because agroforestry is more complicated than monocrop farming, but also because you may live in an environment like Africa, for example, where tenure rights are extremely uncertain. So just imagine what it must feel like to plant a tree or regenerate a tree and care for it, and then wake up one morning and find out that somebody cut it in the night. And this is common across Africa. So unless you have a way of encouraging farmers to plant those trees, many are simply not going to bother. And in richer areas, you still have that problem of the cost. So how do you encourage to do them? Well, by paying for environmental services, of course. But that's difficult because how do you measure 
if a farmer is doing well or not without having armies of assessors roaming the landscape, which is too expensive. Well, these days with satellites, you can do a fair amount of work of high quality. We've developed some pretty nifty algorithms that allow us to map soil organic carbon at very high resolutions, uh, five or 30 meter resolutions using satellite imagery. And we can do it at a degree of precision, which is in the region of 95% of what you could get in a lab. So as long as you can ground truth your soil organic carbon system, the algorithm will do reasonably well. We've done it for Ethiopia, for the entire country at a resolution of 30 meters. And that means that Ethiopia now has a much better soil organic carbon map than any European country. We are very pleased by the fact that the Joint Research Center, the European Union research arm, is working with us to adapt our methodology to try to do the exact same thing in Europe. So it's one of the few areas of science where Africa is outperforming Europe in research. Now, even if trees mitigate a lot of carbon, we are so voracious for energy and for comfort and for all the gadgets of modernity, and there's so many of us that no matter what we do, we're still gonna be pumping a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. So we need to adapt and adaptation is something that trees are absolutely fantastic at. You know that beautiful field of wheat? Well, here's what it looks like before you're putting the next crop down. The wind is blowing and it's carrying your soil away. And you know that beautiful monocrop of cassava in a place like Wanda? Well, when the rains are coming, they're just washing your soils away. So you're just losing soils at an accelerated rate when you don't have any trees in your landscape. And trees protect you even against the worst that the world can give you natural catastrophes. This chart shows an increasing trend for natural catastrophes such as climate events, temperatures, droughts, forest fires, floods, uh, landslides and storms. They're all rising, rising, rising. And what happens in an agroforestry system in such a, an environment? Well, back in 2009, there was a natural experiment in Southwest France. Locals weren't lucky, but we scientists were, because Southwest France is also the place with the most agroforestry in France. So this map shows you the, the uh, speed with which the wind swept through that area. And this picture shows you what a local plantation forest looked like immediately afterwards. There's very little left there. The only thing you can do is chip it for biomass. Value practically zero. This is an agroforestry system in the same area, the summer after the storm went through. The trees were fine, the land is fine, and the system is just as productive as the year before. Why? Of course, because the roots are deeper, the trees are much better anchored in the soil. We also know that crop plants such as wheat or maize have a production that goes down if the temperature goes too high. And we all know that shade is cool. Well, we're scientists, we had to go and measure it, so we did. We went to measure the temperature under an albedo canopy and outside of an albedo canopy, and lo and behold, it's cooler under the tree. And that's great for the kind of crops that African farmers grow. Now, the rest of you know that this is true for livestock. Um, these cows, which have access to shade, are going to be producing on average four to five percent more milk than cows, which have no access to shade. What's not to like? So that's why in agroforestry terms, when we talk of mitigation and adaptation, we don't really know where the first one stops and where the second one begins. Um, it's really hard in agroforestry to adapt without mitigating and to mitigate without adapting. It's really having your cake and eating it. That's not all you can get. You can also get a bunch of environmental services from agroforestry systems. For example, in industrial agricultural systems, one big issue that we have is that a lot of the fertilizer runs away into the water table and into the rivers and pollutes the oceans. Well, in an agroforestry system, you have those tree roots under the crop roots, and they are going to pick up a lot of that excess nitrogen. It's not going to be quite as good as the performance of a forest, but it's going to be a hell of a lot better than the performance in a monocrop system. You have a much better soil biodiversity when you have trees present. Here, you have a system in Latin America that's comparing the presence of earthworms, beetles, centipedes, termites, and ants in the agroforestry system in blue and in the cropping system in red. And the only thing you have more of in the, less of, excuse me, in the agroforestry system is termites, 
which you're happy about, but everything else, which are good adjuncts to have in farming systems, you have more of. Pest control. We had lots and lots of anecdotal evidence, but we recently have research that confirms that agroforestry results in lower abundance of parasitic and non-parasitic weeds and in a higher abundance of the natural enemies of pests. So more trees, more complex ecosystem, less room for pests to munch away at your crops. You also have impact on the water cycle. It's a local story, of course. You have that local buffering effect. You have the drought protection effect of the trees. And you have water recharge. This is work that was published in Nature a couple of years ago. And what it shows is a chart that illustrates what happens to rainfall in environments that are degraded to the left and in environments that are completely forested to the right. And in degraded environments, you have very little infiltration, the blue arrow. You have very little transpiration, the red arrow pointing up. But you have a large amount of surface runoff, the yellow, the orange arrow pointing left, and of soil evaporation, the yellow arrow pointing up. On the extreme right, when you have a lot of forest, you also have relatively little infiltration, groundwater recharge. Uh, sorry, groundwater recharge. You have a lot of infiltration, but you also have a lot of evaporation. The trees are transpiring that water back into the atmosphere. So you have very little surface runoff, but you also have very little recharge of groundwater. The balance is somewhere in the middle. And the picture that you see there, the black and white picture, is a Sahelian parkland landscape. In that environment, you optimize groundwater recharge. And we've done the measurements. We find that in these Sahelian parklands, the water table, far from diminishing because of the trees, is rising thanks to the trees. And in some environments, has risen from 30 meters back to about 5 meters, making the digging of wells and the irrigation of gardens possible again. But it's also a global story. What I'm going to tell you now is the kind of information that the army would pay millions of dollars for, probably billions if they knew what was good for them. First, study this map. What it shows is where dominant winds are blowing. So you, Timothy, are in the American Northwest. Your dominant winds come straight off the Pacific Ocean. And me, I am in Northwestern Europe. My dominant winds come straight off the Atlantic. But if you're in Kenya, your dominant winds come off the Indian Oceans from the east. And if you're in the Sahel, in Niger, or in Nigeria, or in Ghana, or in Liberia, your winds are coming straight from the east, from the Ethiopian and Kenyan highlands. What happens when it rains? Does all that rain go into the rivers? No, much of it evaporates again, mostly through evapotranspiration. And this chart shows you what proportion of rainfall evapotranspirates again. In East Africa, almost all of the water that falls as rain goes back into the atmosphere, as it does over Tibet and across much of Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Turkey, and Southeastern Europe, and as it does in Northeastern Brazil. Where does that rainfall come from then? That's another question we can ask. Does it come from evapotranspiration or does it come from oceans? Well, you can measure that because the isotopic composition of the water will differ depending on whether it evaporated from an ocean or whether it evaporated from a plant. And if you look at Eastern Africa, if you look at South Central, well, some Central Southern America, if you look at China, you find that most of the water that falls as rain there evaporated from trees. Where you are, Timothy, and where I am, almost all of the water came from the oceans, which is the way that we've been conditioned to think about rain, right? It's something that happens because it evaporates from the seas. But so if you compare all these maps, what you notice is that the rains in the Sahelian region come from East Africa. The rains that fall in Kenya and in Ethiopia and in Uganda evapotranspirate and are carried by the dominant winds all the way across to West Africa where they fall as rain. And this is a global phenomenon. When you measure the proportion of rainfall that initially came from plants, you see that almost everywhere it's above 20% and sometimes it's as high as 70%. Look at this again. And here's where the Pentagon should take note. Look at Southeast Asia. 
The dominant winds are coming from Malaysia, Burma, and are moving into the breadbasket of China. Look at where that rainfall comes from. About half of the rain that China gets in its breadbasket comes from evapotranspiration. Right now, you have lots of Chinese companies that are cutting down the forests in Southeast Asia. What China is doing is literally sawing the branch on which it sits. It's going to be reducing its rainfall and it's going to find it increasingly difficult to farm thanks to this misguided activity. So, having said all that, we now have a pretty good idea of what the transition to sustainability is going to be looking like. It's going to be requiring fewer inputs and fewer machinery, thus fewer, less capital, but it's going to be requiring more expertise, more knowledge, more skills, and more labor. And that gives you all sorts of goodies like resilience, sustainability, risk-proofing, micronutrients, etc. And it reduces all sorts of baddies like greenhouse gas emissions, land degradation, biodiversity loss, etc., etc. Your yields are going to be roughly the same, maybe a bit higher, maybe a bit lower, depends on how good a farmer you are. But because you have lower costs, your net incomes are likely to be higher. So while the future is pretty win-lose, yeah, it's good at producing one crop, but apart from that, it's lousy at using resources and it needs a lot of inputs. The future can very much be win-win, where you have much better use of natural resources, you still produce your crops, but you also produce all sorts of other good things, including cultural amenities. Now, I hope I've convinced you that this is true, that the land equivalency ratio of agroforestry systems is always higher than one, and that these techniques are part of the future. But then we have to ask a serious question. If that is true, why then does the world look like this? Why do farmers across Africa, when they picture themselves as being successful, imagine this kind of landscape? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. The first is because the way we build institutions is to build silos. So to manage a complex system, we create a complex thing called a government, and that government is going to have a ministry of agriculture, a ministry of environment, a ministry for climate change, a ministry for this, a ministry for that. And so each of these boxes is going to have its own little group of specialists, its own um, scientific journals, its own conferences, its own businesses, and its own financial flows, largely self-contained. The real world, of course, looks like this. In the real world, nutrients and water and gases flow between each of these systems. And if we were to manage the real world, we'd have to manage it like a gardener and not like an engineer. That means we don't need a ministry of agriculture and we don't need a ministry of forestry. We need a ministry of natural resources that's able to adjudicate between all of these different land users out there. So that's the first issue, our tendency to think in silos. The second one is a cultural issue. To most everybody, show this to your mother and they will say, God, what a beautiful, healthy soil. What a gorgeous field. But we know it's not healthy. And most people looking at this will think, my God, God, that's a picture of abject poverty. Whereas we know that this is probably quite a healthy field that can keep on going for centuries. So we have that cultural thing. We've all been dictated upon by the idea that this is the future and this is the past, when of course it's the exact opposite. And that's linked to a nasty human disease called progressivism. Modernity. Futurism, this is the enemy. What this postcard shows is Birmingham, England in the 1920s. And what you see is a mixed use system. You have housing on the upper floors, you have factories and shops on the ground floors, you have markets, you have transport, you have pedestrians. There's life going on there. But this had to go. In the 1950s, it was replaced by that. This rapidly became, this rapidly turned Birmingham into the sickest city in the United Kingdom with rapidly rising rates of suicide, depression, domestic violence, crime, unemployment, alcoholism. Because there's nothing there. There's no room for people. There's room for cars. There is single use buildings. 
you're supposed to be live a long way away, take a bus or a car to go a long way away to work, take another bus or another car to go a long way away to shop. You don't know your neighbors. You have no sense of rootedness and of community. You're alienated. And if you think that this was only a problem of capitalism, by the way, I have a nice old collection of Soviet uh, posters, and this is my favorite. This is one that's extolling the power and the prowess of Soviet agriculture. <laughs> now, what you see is the proud claim that they are now producing a million tractors a year. So it's an agricultural poster, right? You see a fertilizer plant in the background and a tractor in the foreground. There is not a single plant in that poster, not a leaf, not a grain, nothing green at all. And yet, it's an agricultural poster. So there's that. We've got to deprogram ourselves from this kind of thinking that the future always means better machinery. Then, mm -hmm. another problem is our business model. Oh, God. You want to know what our business model is like? This is our business model. Right now, our monetization strategy mostly involves us begging for money from people who have it. And the reason for that, of course, it's a cash flow issue. If I teach you, Timothy, how to do agroforestry, maybe I spend a couple of days at your place, maybe you're generous and you pay me a few hundred dollars a consulting fee, but then you know what you're doing. Maybe you'll call me a few times to ask how to prune this or where to plant that, but you'll be on your own and it'll work. But if instead I miss a Syngenta and I sell you my gorgeous seed that has been stacked with just the right genes to give you that fantastic yield with this particular fertilizer and those particular herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides. And I'll guarantee you it'll work. And you know what? It will work. It won't work for very long, but it will work for a few years. And when it stops working, I've got an even better seed with more genes and better fertilizers that will also work for a few shorter years. It'll keep on working. That means that if I'm Syngenta here in Europe, I'm going to be making on average 200 euros per hectare per year from every farmer in the landscape. Whereas if I'm an agroforester, I might be making 200 euros from one farmer once. I have no business plan. I have no cash flow. So I can't market. I can't research. I can't lobby. I, you know, when I run, my job is to run around the European institutions that get them to do more of this. There's one of me. There's hundreds of people representing the input companies and big, big ag. So we have that problem. But we also shoot ourselves in the foot. Oh boy, do we shoot ourselves in the foot. Our marketing. <sighs> they call this conventional agriculture or traditional agriculture. And we call it traditional agriculture or conventional agriculture. There's nothing conventional about it. There's nothing traditional about it. It didn't exist 70 years ago and it won't exist in 70 years time. It's industrial agriculture. That's all it is. And we should always refer to it as industrial agriculture. But their genius has been to call this conventional agriculture, irrespective of what that monocrop is, whether that monocrop is maize or wheat or hogs or beef or, or cabbages, it's conventional agriculture. We, huh. we, we don't have marketing. We have gurus. And every guru reinvents the wheel and brands it with its own little name. And so out there, there's dozens upon dozens upon dozens of names for agricultural systems that all basically mean combine crops, perennials and animals and think before you spray. And there's lots of them. There's a massive amount of them and I'm collecting them. And if you have some good ones, please send them my way. I want that slide to become a full pink. And finally, we are really bad at learning the lessons of this guy. We know when we think about it that we should consider the Umwelt of other creatures. And perhaps we'll look upon the Umwelt of this elephant with sympathy. What is it like to feel the entire world through this really complex trump? that you can smell with, drink with, grab with, battle with. It must be strange, right? But you can just about imagine what that would feel like to have your nose grow and, and turn into that. 
But how can you imagine what it feels like to be this, this jellyfish? What does it feel like to float in the ocean, to feed, to find a mate, to reproduce? In that environment where you have a distributed neural system, no central neural system, and where you are so good at your job that you've been floating around that ocean for hundreds of millions of years, come hell or high water. It's a lot easier to imagine this type of creature, isn't it? We know that when that kind of creature is happy, it's got access to the food that it like. We know how to bunch it, to imitate what happens in natural systems. We know how to manage it, to put carbon back into the soil using the beneficial impacts of these ruminants. So, so far, what we've seen are sympathetic creatures whose umwelt we'd like to understand but would struggle to, weird creatures whose umwelt we would be really, really hard pressed to understand no matter how hard we try, and creatures that we work with whose umwelt we try to make our own in order to make them more productive. Now, what about this creature? How is the umwelt of that creature? Do you understand that umwelt? Do you know how to work with that umwelt? <laughs> Perhaps you find it easier to work with the umwelt of this creature. After all, he's trying to do the sorts of things that we do to convince his parishioners to change their behaviors in a different way. Oh, why is this in French? Sorry. What about this creature? What is it like to go to you this office every day of your life and to be surrounded by these piles of moldering paper. Now, perhaps apart from Mr. Trump, you haven't seen anybody here who you have an immediate negative emotional reaction to. And yet, we have them all the time. What about this creature? This worker who's assembling a nuclear power plant. Do you think he's an evil person that is trying to poison the world? Or is he a guy who is generally convinced that the technology he has is a key part of the solution? What's his umwelt like? How can you sympathize with him? What about this gentleman? This is a scientist. He works in a greenhouse. And his salary is paid by, and the greenhouse is owned by, Monsanto. Is this guy an evil genius? Or is this guy also believe that what he's doing is helping making the world a better place? Can you get into his homeworld? Can you, can you understand what he has to contribute to the conversation? Well, maybe you can, but probably not if your idea of dialogue is this or that. And yet we know that we need all of these intelligence around the table. Most of you have probably heard of the drawdown site, and I've just outlined two of the solutions. Number 19, manage grazing which a lot of people here know about, and nuclear power. Their ability to help the world is currently estimated as being roughly similar. And we need both. And if I can leave you with any message, it is this. Yes, we need agroforestry. God knows we need agroforestry. And boy, do we need holistic grazing and agroecology and to empower small farmers and to ensure that we grow a multiplicity of good food close to the consumers. But we also need GMOs because we also need to protect certain crops like papayas from diseases that we don't know how to handle other ways. And we also need nuclear power. We need all of the above. We need every single one of these solutions. Does that mean that every single one of these solutions will always be applicable and always be good in every single circumstance? No, of course not. Like most of you, I really dislike the way that GMOs are being used by large corporations to fatten their bottom line, as opposed to doing things for the benefit of a wider world. But I do know that that technology can be just as useful as a hammer is useful to put a nail in the wall to hang a painting. After all, we don't ban hammers because some people use them to bash in the heads of their partners. So I will leave you with this saying by this one gentleman. He is Stuart Brand. He was the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog. And he is an absolutely fascinating thinker. And he has come to the conclusion that on this planet, humans have become gods. It doesn't matter whether we want to be gods or not, we are. 
there is no part of this planet we're not influencing. The very climate is changing, the oceans are changing because we're here. We cannot abdicate the responsibility of being gods, so we have to learn to do it well. And in order to do it well, the one species that you can never, never, never forget, the one keystone species that must always be at the center of your thoughts, is us. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks, Patrick. That was, that was uh, that's quite a lot. Um, and, and keep those questions coming. We're going to go ahead and get started with the questions. I know I have a couple, but we'll, uh, we'll get to some of these first. And then if we have time, maybe, maybe we can uh, go there. But um, let's, let's start with uh, the first one. Kirsten, earlier on, asked, uh, Dear Patrick, what are some of um, the most – oh, what's that, Patrick? Yes. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out where do I – oh, yeah, here, okay, I see it. Kirsten van Reisen asked, Dear Patrick, what are some of the most common ah. mistakes made in agroforestry systems? Oof. That hamper the 40% yeah. productivity increase that you refer to. So yeah. I, assume, I, I assume, Kirsten, that you are referring to the wheat walnut system that I showed earlier. Um, well, a common mistake to make is to mismanage your trees in that system. Uh, trees are organisms that will seek to take up the available space. So the most important thing that you can do is to prune them. And while most people understand that they have to prune them above the ground, some people don't understand that they also have to prune them below the ground. In these systems, if you're going to be growing uh, um, in an alley cropping system, it pays to actually disc the tree roots regularly to ensure that they don't invade the part of the land that you want to devote to. Of course, you don't need to do that if you're doing a short rotation coppice uh, for biomass, for example, because the roots then don't have the time to spread into the system. Um, other mistakes that are made are really mistakes of caring with the trees. Remember that most agroforestry systems started off as farms, where farmers are adding trees, rather than as foresters, where foresters are adding crops. And farmers have no training in forestry. They don't know how to manage their trees. They don't know how to recognize diseases or signs of stress or signs of nutrient deficiency. And so unless they receive advice and help, they are going to find that their trees are going to do a little bit less well than they were hoping. They will still do well enough. But so instead of getting a 40% productivity increase, maybe at the end of the day, you only end up with a 20% productivity increase. Nice to have, but not as good as you could get. Mm -hmm. Then John, hello John, I'm glad to see you joined. Um, you're asking if the camps could be helpful in spreading these kinds of agroforestry systems? Absolutely. The camps have two advantages over normal farmers. First, they have lots of people coming in and leaving. That means they have lots of people who are fresh and who are fascinated and who want to learn and who want to contribute, as opposed to people who get bored and people who want to move on and do something else. The second thing that they have, as I understand it, is they're planning for the long term. And so when they are starting the restoration camp, they're putting the key lines in, they're, they're, they're designing the system before the first spade hits the ground. And that means that it's much, much easier to build in a much more complex agroforestry system than the simple ones I have described. Systems where you're using six, seven, or eight different tree species rather than just the one. Mm -hmm. All right. So we... Move on to uh, the next question then. Uh, Ruben Heineke. So farmers are moving to the city because their plot is too small. Should we read the question or? Uh, yeah, why don't you read it? Okay. In the south of Spain, Sierra Nevada mountains, many farmers move away to the city because their plot is too small to have sufficient profits with conventional farming. So agroforestry would be such a great solution. Unfortunately, the governments give subsidies for agricultural use of the land. And in particular, when I was there, I, I know I learned that they, they give subsidies for, for tilling, you know, um, maybe that's what he's referring to. In practice, this has a counter effect for the farmers take the subsidies while living in the city at the same time neglect the land. Is there any data available about good combinations to go for in a specific area? Absolutely. It's a disaster, and it's a disaster that we in Brussels are working at. You may know that right now the European Union is changing its common agricultural policy, and we're trying to push it in a direction that's taking this more into account. Because right now, about half the income of a farmer in Europe comes in the form of subsidies from the European Union, and that's the same for Spanish farmers. 
And if you make a mistake and you don't get the subsidy as a result of that mistake, you, you suffer badly. One mistake you could make is to have too many trees on your land because then it stops being seen as agricultural land and it becomes seen as forestry land. And forestry has a completely different subsidy regime from agriculture. So farmers are reluctant to put trees in because of that. Another thing that you can do is to move over to systems that are very low in labor demand, but that provide environmental services and money. And typically those will be the systems that in, in Spain are known as the Deheza, or in Portugal are known as the Montado systems, where you are combining animals and trees as opposed to crops and trees. Southern Spain is a relatively dry environment, so it's an environment in which waters are the premium. Uh, so typically the kind of horticulture that is happening there is happening thanks to irrigation. That means the water has to be pumped from below grounds. The water table is dropping. It's not a sustainable system. A silver pastoral system, a system where you combine trees and animals, could be far more sustainable in that environment. It would also have an additional benefit, is it would suppress the risk of fire. Some of you may remember that last summer there were very, very heavy fires in Portugal that killed over 100 people. And these farmers happened in two kinds of environment in plantation forestry where people had put sitka spruce scottish pine and eucalyptus sorry scottish pine and eucalyptus not sitka what am i thinking uh, um, in very dense stands and once they start burning the fire spreads with extraordinary rapidity and the second reason is because of a phenomenon similar to the one you described in the sierra nevada lots of little plots in the mountains that have been abandoned by the people who own them and where brush is accumulating and that brush, of course, burns when a fire comes. The way to deal with that is to encourage these people to join a cooperative so that you can farm animals under those trees. They will clear the brush. Pigs, sheep, cattle will clear the brush, exploit those resources, and provide you with an additional income. Now, I personally don't know what the situation in the Sierra Nevada mountains is. I don't know the rainfall patterns. I don't know the soils. So I cannot give a recommendation about what would be appropriate there. But I suspect that something like this, a collaborative system where the owners of the land are cooperatively letting animals manage that landscape may be the solution you're looking for. Right. We have a couple other questions in the, uh, that were put in the chat. So um, instead of the Q and A box, so it just takes a little more time, but uh, here it is. So first we had Teresa earlier ask, uh, it's similar to the last question, but I think specifically referring to the sort of human psychology motivation of just, things. Just, just uh, let me interrupt you. Where do I see the chat? Uh, the chat, if you click on the chat thing at the bottom, you can see the chat. The chat thing on the bottom? I don't see a chat thing at the bottom. There's a chat icon at the bottom. Uh, I'm using a Mac and I don't see a chat icon. Oh, it's okay. I, I can read it out loud. It's, it's... Oh, hang on. It's maybe at the top here to remote control more. Oh, here we go. I've got the chat. All right. Okay. So Teresa asked a question. Yeah. How, how do you think it is possible to get people to do intensively, uh, to intensively farm? So like on the land, a lot of people, when we see the overwhelming desire to move to cities and city life. Uh, I don't think there is an issue here on the country. Mm -hmm. City life, I mean, there's so many of us on the planet. We have to pack most of them into cities. And if people want to do that anyway, great, you know? Right. Um, there are people who want to stay on the land and there's enough of them who want to stay on the land and people want to get back on the land if farming becomes more like gardening. If farming is something that involves sinking as well as laboring. Right. And you see that, I don't know how it's like in the US, but in Europe you see that a lot. You have young people who are setting themselves up as horticulturalists, usually small plots of land, highly productive, often permaculture style, where they are generating fruits and vegetables, which they are then selling in direct sale uh, to, uh, to customers. I mean, I, you know, I've got, there's one kid uh, who is 20, well, kid, he's 26 now. He was at school with my son and he's got his farm not far from here. And every week I get a box of fresh vegetables uh, and it's always a pleasure. Um, the difficulty is to get access to larger farms to those people. Um, larger farms are, Farmland is expensive, especially in Europe because of the subsidies you get, so it's really hard for young farmers to get started. However, there's an interesting development here, and it has to do with the aristocracy. There is a farmers' organization in Europe called ELO, the European Landowners Association, and they're basically aristocrats. 
There are people who have owned and managed hundreds or thousands of acres of land over centuries and who are continuing to do that. And one thing I find interesting, and I'm really astonished that as a good leftist, I am now sympathizing with the aristocracy, is that these people have a long-term way of thinking about their land. I'm also speaking to people who manage agricultural funds in the city of London and such like. Those people have 10-year time horizons. Their funds close after 10 years. They're going to extract the maximum value of their land over 10 years. And if they leave a radioactive wasteland at the end of it, they don't give a fuck because after 10 years, they're closed. Aristocrats want to pass the land on to their children and their children's children, and they got it from their grandparents and their grandparents' grandparents. Hmm. So they're interested in making money, of course, but they're interested in doing so in a way that will maintain the quality of that land for future generations. Right. Like Not the all order, of them, but enough of them. Like the owner, like Alfonso, who owns the land that the first camp is on. Their family's been there for, in the region for 500 years farming. They have a vested interest in it going well. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I know a guy like that in Portugal as well that welcomed us last summer for a research project. You know, great guy, 500 hectares of Montado. Of course he wants to do it well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. All right. Well, we got Toby's question next. Uh, shall I read it? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Because you're still in the chat window, right? Uh, this one's in the Q&A now. We're kind of going oh, back, right. okay. back and forth depending on where people put it. But, uh, right. Oh, yeah, uh, I see it, yeah. Yeah, Toby Kellner says, um, Hi, Patrick. And this is an interesting question. Um, well, they're all interesting in their way. But you mentioned managed grazing. I am in some Facebook groups which advocate Savory's holistic management grazing as an alternative, uh, often a superior alternative to reforestation. I know the simple answer is it depends on the climate zone. But I have seen both reforestation and holistic grazing proposed for the same kind of arid regions. What is your take on this? Um, I have no take. It depends. You know, a, a, a lot of this depends on what people want to do. After all, it's a land manager has to be comfortable with a solution. Um, if it's an arid region, reforestation as such is probably not a good idea because trees do need water. Um, yes, you have some trees, you know, there's, there's a, you have trees like Saxaul in Central Asia. It can cope with practically no water at all, and it sucks up pollution, pollutants, uh, so it's, it's wonderful. But hey, it takes half a century for the damn thing to grow to three feet. So uh, m most trees will demand a little bit of water. So in arid zones, um, forestation is probably not an issue. So I, I suspect that your question could be formulated as saying, do we have holistic management or do we have a form of silver pastoralism? where we have trees and animals. And to me, there's no conflict between the two. If you have a silver pastoral system, you've also got to manage it holistically in order to get the maximum benefit from it. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have trees in that landscape is not actually relevant to the idea of holistic management. And if you look at the environment in which uh, Alan Savory did most of his early work in Zimbabwe, it's completely filled with trees. Yeah. So um, to, to me, um, properly grazed land, properly managed land, unless you're in extremely dry areas, is probably going to have an element of tree regeneration as well. Right. Yeah. And I, I know I've heard similar from Savory and from uh, uh, Darren Doherty, who definitely incorporates holistic management into his Regrarians platform. Uh, I think that's more and more common is this kind of hybrid approach um, in those sorts of approaches. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from... I might pronounce this wrong. Jure Zwart. That's, uh, hi, all. Two questions regarding the presentation. Why is the root system in agroforestry deeper than in conventional agroforestry, agriculture and forests? So I guess she wants a recap of that. And then, or he, uh, and then what is the lazy nodule effect? Right. Thank the you. First, the, the, the first question is, um, it, it's simply because um, when you put crops down, like wheat, for example, they are planted at very high densities and they have roots that are about 80 centimeters deep. So if you put yourself in the gestalt, in the umwelt of a tree root, and you're shooting sideways looking for some room, you're, you're meeting this forest of wheat roots. And so you can't really move very far without a lot of effort, so you die out. Whereas your brothers and sisters rootlets that are deeper down in the soil find that they can move sideways more easily. Now in a forest system, most of the roots are going to be close to the surface for one very simple, for two very simple reasons. The first is you want to grow really quickly. That means you need stability. And to have stability, you need to have a large base. So you send your, your, uh, your roots 
sideways as much as possible. Second, by selling your route sideways, you are claiming this plot of land saying, hey, this is mine, no trespassing. And you're preventing other trees from growing too close to yourself. So you maximize your own chances of growing tall and straight and thus getting to the light. Because remember, in a forest, all the trees are yearning for the same light and are competing for that light. That's why the root system is lower in an agroforestry system than in a forestry system. Now, for the lazy nodule effect, it's simply you, you have plants that are legumes. And when a plant is a legume, it means like, like peanut or groundnuts uh, or soy. It means that it fixes nitrogen. It's not actually the plant itself that fixes that nitrogen. It's little bacteria that the plant lives in symbiosis with. And these bacteria live in, in, in root nodules, literally little, little growth on the root areas, which are filled with these bacteria that fix the nitrogen. And so the, the plant benefits from the nitrogen that the bacteria supplies and the bacteria benefits from the sugars that the plant produces. And you get a lazy nodule effect when you have too much nitrogen in that soil. The plant doesn't need to host so many uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria since it's having another source of nitrogen. And from the plant's perspective, that other source of nitrogen is better because the bacteria it has to reward, it has to pay with a little bit of its sugar production. Whereas the nitrogen that's just available freely in the soil, you can just take without paying for it. So that's what I mean by the lazy nodule effect. Right. Yeah, cool. Um, John Liu has another question. Um, do you think that the economy could change? I've noted that the ecosystem is much more valuable than stuff. Could there be a new currency or a new economy that compensates people for restoring ecological function rather than just extraction of food as, as commodities? Uh, the, the, the short answer is yes, you can pay to restore ecological function and uh, various actors, including private foundations, governments, multinational organizations like the EU, and indeed you, John, are trying to do exactly that. But I don't think that means that you go into a new economy. The economy, as it exists today, is a reflection of who we are as a species. And we are an extremely collaborative species. We discovered a long time ago that the best way of surviving was to bang, join together in order to divide our labor because the result of that would be higher than if everybody was trying to hunt their own bison and grow their own food and build their own house and mill their own beer, brew their own beer and blah, 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 blah. It's much easier if everybody specializes in the things that they're good at and if we then trade with other people who are good at something else in order to get what we need. For example, all these books over there. It's a lot easier to buy them because, than to have to try to write them myself, right? <laughs> and the economy does that. That's what the economy is good at. The economy is good at creating these kind of super organisms called governments or civic societies or corporations that are good at maximizing value. What the economy is really bad at is giving value of a non-monetary form to these entities. Human beings have ethics. We know, for example, that it's a bad idea to take money from a starving child when you have a lot of money already. Corporations have no ethics. Corporations are profit-maximizing entities. And it doesn't matter whether the corporation is there to grow food or to build mobile phones or to do anything else. It belongs to stockholders, and most stockholders are only interested in the returns that they get from holding that stock. So amorality is built into the economy. And the way we deal with that, and the way we have been dealing with that for centuries, perhaps even millennia, is to put in place rules and regulations that prevent corporations, capital-owning and deploying entities, from overstepping certain boundaries. And we used to call that religions, now we call it laws and regulations, but these things always exist. And these things are never good enough. And these things are never foolproof. There's always a corporation or a capitalist or a capital deploying entity, it could be a government, for example, that deploys that capital in the wrong way, um, in a bad way, in a way that is antithetical to life or to the interests of the wider community. And the way we deal with that is as a society, by having these conversations and these debates, and by lobbying our decision makers and by coming together in groups that are protesting against things. And that's how things slowly change. For example, to take a different uh, uh, thing, let's talk about human rights. Now, most people will agree with the following statement. 
Human rights need to be given to all human individuals, irrespective of their race, their creed, their gender, or their sexual orientation. That's the modern standard, right? But 30 years ago, it would have been different. 30 years ago, it would have been all men need to be given human rights. And under that would have been all white men, maybe 70 years ago. So things that we believe to be ethical foundation stones are nothing such. They evolve over time. They get better and better over time. And sometimes they get worse. We see a recrudescence of nationalism and of, uh, of right-wing exclusivism, alt-right, white supremacy, and all of those things. And it's not just happening in the US. It's happening everywhere in the world. So these things are, it's, it's not a smooth, progressive curve. It, 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 it's more like a, like a, like a saw. Um, and sometimes it can go quite deep. It did so in the 1930s before it starts climbing again. So it's, it's maybe two steps forward, one step back, and sometimes it's two steps forward, three steps back. But I don't think, I think what the history of the world shows is that these widely different economic outcomes, Sweden, the United States, or Somalia, Zimbabwe, Russia, are always achieved with the same basic economic system, a system where there is a division of labor and where people use a means of exchange called money in order to acquire that which they are bad at producing themselves and that money they get by doing something which they're good at producing themselves. Mm -hmm. So I am now promoting John Liu to a panelist because he has three more questions and why don't we just have a, con a conversation with him instead, huh? Hey, John. Let, let's, I mean, un unmute him. Here he is. Now he can talk to you. Welcome, John. Hey, turn on your video if you can, John. It'd be lovely to see you. Uh, I think I'm blue, <clears throat> but uh, let me see. There Yay. you are. Yay. Yay. It's, a, it's a party now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where, where are you right now, John? Beijing? Yes, it's uh, f almost four in the morning. <clears throat> so I'm go, go to bed, John. I know, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but Allard, Allard uh, pushed me. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, John, are you, uh, are you open to asking the, the next three questions that you, that you wrote down in person? Do you want to either speak to it or read it or whatever you like? Uh, I can't because they, they disappeared. Would you like me to read them or do you want to, uh, and then you guys yeah, can talk? Or? They're, they're more like comments. Let's go ahead and read yeah. them now. I'll just read them their comments and then and then we'll see you guys can engage um, do you think that the okay we did that one um, your you, your statement suggests that the only way to create value is to buy and sell things I think that this needs to be discussed more than this es explanation we can go further in our understanding that means we don't need to produce things to create values uh, I think that all living beings have inalienable rights and then you do agree that it's a societal choice Yes. A amen to all of that, obviously. I mean, you know, the, the economy, the way of, you know, all, all of us associate with others, usually in families, sometimes in much larger groups, where we create things together without expecting a monetary reward, either implicit or explicit. Um, all of us participate in community groups. All of us are helping to do things that we believe in. All of us are, for example, standing up in the middle of the night to listen to a webinar when we could be asleep and not getting paid for it. So of course, uh, of course, we are all. It's what gives us meaning. It gives us meaning to change the world, or at least to have the illusion that we can change the world. It gives us meaning to raise children. It gives us meaning to see our partner be happy. And none of that can be measured with money. But what money can do is provide us with a more comfortable way of expressing our inner nature as human beings. And I think that in that sense, the economy is invariant. It, you can run it well, you can run it badly, you can have a bunch of assholes running it, you can have a bunch of saints running it, but the, the system as it is, is unlikely to ever undergo an absolutely fundamental change. Which doesn't mean that you can't have changes in the proportion of things. For example, you could very easily reduce the proportion of time and of resources that you devote to monetary exchanges and increase the proportion of time and of resources that you devote to non-monetary activities. And that is, in fact, what is happening around the world. Some countries do more on the monetary side, like the U.S. Some countries do less on the monetary side, like Sweden. 
Should we um, maybe lose the um, the you know the background or the? Yeah. Why don't you stop sharing screen, Patrick? Good idea. Maybe you could. Oh, uh, 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 okay. Let me up, see what. Bring up all those uh, other people and let them talk. Yeah. yeah hang on. Uh, here we go. Uh, what do I click on this one? Post share. Stop share. Here you go. My screen sharing is uh, is gone. Is is that all right? Can you? Is my screen gone? Yes. No. Marvelous. Here, let me turn on this this light so you can see my face. It's not night here. Or, or, or is that worse? Does that make me look like some kind of ghost in the machine? Probably. All right. <laughs> so, but I still have the Q and A's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're still. There's, uh, a lot, there's a lot of stuff in the chat box. Yeah, but uh, I don't think we have anything new. I think we've gotten all that stuff in the chat box. John, did you have anything else to add to that conversation? That uh, Patrick's response. Um, I'm I'm good. Are are there okay. other people who can talk, or can people get on or not? They can only write. Well, no, nope. anybody can. That I just got to click a button. Um, would anybody else like to speak, John? Uh, John, that's a nice suggestion. Anybody. We could we could have a full party. Uh, we I don't think we have the bandwidth to have everybody have video, so I think that's a limitate a limiting factor. Or we could have a screen full of people talking, which could get pretty confusing. But um, yeah, I'm down. Anybody want to talk? Uh, put it in the chat box. And uh, other in the meantime, I have a question. A um, couple questions. If you want to ha hang around, John, and maybe we'll get the party bigger. Um, First question, real quick, when you were talking about the role of trees in the hydrological cycle, mm -hmm. uh, can you say, uh, say, add one thing to that, maybe speak to the, the role of the condensation nuclei that they create in the rainfall patterns? Because you talked about the local effects with infiltration, you talked about the wind and their transpiration, but I don't think you addressed the condensation nuclei that they emit and how that can affect either the rainfall in C2 or somewhere else. Can you speak to that? Um, yes, I didn't mention it because I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry, I can't speak okay. to that. Okay, great. I know, it I know it exists, but I don't know the details. I haven't read the relevant papers. So, okay. um, I, you know, I, 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 know it, I know it's a good thing, but my comment cannot go beyond that. Okay, wonderful. Um, so my other question um, has to do with, I guess, so we're talking about non-human intelligence. We're talking about domestication and ways of making that more more sensible ways that are more like an ecosystem um you know because the way we've done it in the past we've domesticated a lot of things it's given us certain yields but it's decreased certain ecosystem functions we've mm -hmm. we've domesticated rivers we've domesticated the oryx you know in each case we've gotten something but we've also sort of oftentimes decreased nutritional value oftentimes decreased the resilience and the yeah. ecosystem benefits of that species and also I'm, I'm thinking of how my friend byron joel in australia he he says he prefers these semi-wild landscapes um I, the, the the question is i guess you know so you mentioned we've become as gods we might as well act as such and there is that um and then there's also this question of like say you mentioned in the great plains and the bison for many thousand years now since the holocene um, they've pretty much been gods in the Great Plains. So can you speak in any way to like collaboration where other um, land managers kind of resume their roles? Uh, and maybe that mystery that what we can never know and how our intelligence might play a role that's not just the controller, but that's also the collaborator with other managing intelligences. Can you speak that, to that? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, the, that, that's the humility of the land manager. It's, the land, it's, you know, a good land manager is, is somebody who looks and listens and, and waits and feels before deciding what to do. Mm -hmm. um, a good land manager understands what his trees and his animals are telling him. He doesn't ever understand them in great detail because he's not God, but he understands them well enough to do better than what he's doing today. And all, all the best land managers I've met, and I use the word land manager in order not to fall into this artificial dichotomy between farmers and ranchers and foresters, all the best land managers I've met have one thing in common. They are geeks. They are total geeks. They spend their time from morning to evening on their land, listening, smelling, touching, waiting, observing. And then they change a little thing here and a little thing there, and they see what happens, and they improve over time. 
Mm -hmm. And that's the humility of, of the manager. And it's the humility of common intelligence. It's understanding what your, your environment is trying to tell you. Um, an industrial farmer has a completely different approach. An industrial farmer sends in a bulldozer and gets rid of absolutely everything on the land. He then turns into, the, in, into this perfectly flat landscape in which he puts one seed down with giant machinery, and he then has to supply all of the ecosystem services that environments gave you for free. He has to supply the nutrition. He has to supply the pest control. He has to supply the shade. He has to supply the irrigation. So I, I really don't understand why people do it. It's really expensive. It completely destroys the local environment. It doesn't make a great deal of profit. And it's really boring because all you get to do is sit in this stupid machine all day long, breathing in noxious chemicals. I, don't, I really don't get it. John. Could, could I just mention that I, I think that we have a, a, a kind of a hybrid thing that we have to do. Clearly, we're required to put some things back in place. But when we're, when we're working, I think one of the outcomes that we want to see is an evolutionary outcome. You know, the, the reason that we have an, a, a, an oxygenated atmosphere and a freshwater system and soil fertility and biodiversity is because of this non-human intelligence that permeates in, in a symbiotic web of life. And it is, it is this outcome that we can't determine. We don't know enough to determine that. And we, and we never will know enough to determine it. Exactly. So I think what we're trying to do is restore some basic ecological functions and allow, we're, we're trying to align with evolutionary systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then when we do, the outcome in the long term will not be simply a cultural outcome. It will be, you know, it will have had cultural impacts, but it will go back to having a, an evolutionary outcome. That's, that's yeah. all I want. No, I think that's absolutely right. I think what, you know, another way of talking about uh, a commonality of intelligences or talking about the humility of the land manager who listens and walks is understanding why a place is the way it is. And the reason why a place is the way it is is because of long evolutionary processes. The evolutionary processes that have affected every species and the evolutionary processes that have affected how these species interact with one another in that unique context. That's clear. And, you know, and, and a clever farmer knows how to observe that and use it to his advantages. A stupid farmer just knows how to blast it with chemicals. Right. Um, well, we are near the end. We have a little special thing we haven't done yet in the last two. Um, we're going to get an update from the camp. John, if you want to, can you unmute yourself and give us a little music, intro music for this, for this update from the camp? <laughs> I am going to promote Kirsten, who's a longtime camper, two panelists, and we're going to get an update from the camp. Uh, we have one more question that just came in there. Oh, okay. Let, let's, uh, we can do that question and, and then get the update. And Kirsten, we can, uh, we'll do Ruben's question and then we'll get the update from you, Kirsten, okay? Um, Ruben says, areas lacking biomass often have high unemployment numbers and face poverty. While there is a lot of work to be done in terms of restoration, it is often considered voluntary. Would it be thinkable that restoring land could be rewarded money-wise in the future? This in terms of salary for the good work that is done, the need is there, the knowledge is there, and the people are there. What are your thoughts? Here, here, here. Yes. That's a key thing that we're trying, that, that we're discussing here in Brussels, trying to, to figure out a way of ensuring that some of that financial mass of agricultural subsidies flows in that direction. Um, obviously, industry has no interest in this, so it's not blocking it. Everybody thinks it's a good idea, but everybody will tell you it's a good idea, but nobody's actually going to write the text and allocate the budget lines. I, th so I, think, this what is, we're on. I think this is the way that we change the economy. I think, I think this, is, this is where we really see that it's ludicrous to talk about the value of stuff when these ecosystem functions are the basis of life. Yeah. And we've said that they're zero. It can't be true. Yeah, so absolutely. we really need to address this. And the people who are doing this, I think 
what, what, what I started to do about 25 years ago was to follow this path. And I believe that what happens is you end up creating huge value, unbelievable value, value beyond what anybody is imagining now. So it's not like you have to buy and sell more and more junk in order to create value. You don't. You need to restore the natural ecological function. And all of the people in, in the camps, all the people in this movement, all of the people, there are billions of people who are disenfranchised and have been by those, those historical inequities that have come from feudalism and from all these other, other slavery and, and, and genocide and, and suppression. I think, you know, all of these people have equal rights. And, you know, when we say that, when we, when we understand that, then, you know, it's, it's going to be a completely different economy and it's going to be a completely different outcome. You, you won't be able to pollute. You won't be able to degrade. That is a, a new paradigm that has a higher level of consciousness. That's where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna get to this. Uh, we got one more question came in, but I think you kind of covered it, but uh, Elizabeth says, can we consider value coming from functional ecosystems as green infrastructure that can be supported as we see hard infrastructure supporting our economies? In California, we need to manage for ongoing and growing water needs. Uh, do you feel like you addressed that kind of the functional ecosystem as, yeah. Yeah, we get we, we have that we have programs in Europe to do just that. So there's actually money flowing uh, called the Life Program, and the Natura 2000 program is conservation. The Life Program is about functional green infrastructure. Uh, you know, uh, yes, it's 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 not nearly enough. It's not nearly as quick as it needs to be, but it's a step in that direction. That's that's yeah. definitely happening. Great. All right. Well, that's it for the Q and A, and we're gonna we're gonna close out with uh, Kirsten is uh, my friend over at the camp there. You're, you're there right now, and uh, let's get an update. What's happening at the camp now? What are you guys up to? How's it going? Good to see you. Hi, Kirsten. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Kirsten. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Patrick, for this excellent session. Um, it's been great. You're welcome. And, um, uh, I, I have to switch mindsets a little bit to back to our own little reality here. Um, we are really excited because we moved to camp a couple of weeks ago, um, finally. So we've been living in this house that I'm in now for the Wi-Fi um, for the past year. But now we're finally actually living there and we're ready to accept more people. Um, so we can really start growing this movement and start offering courses. Um, we're also in the process of developing business models to make our our local camp more financially sustainable and not be so dependent on the foundation so that we can use the the money that the members donate to build more camps around the world and not it just going to this one camp mm -hmm. so it's a it's a really exciting time it feels like we're growing up and we're becoming this adult place um <laughs> yeah it's a lot of fun and our cover crops are looking amazing um we can already see the difference between where we put organic compost and where we just put some fertilizer pellets uh -huh. the, there's different things growing in the different places and it's much denser in the composted area um, and we're learning a lot about that through observation um, one of our volunteers is currently enrolled in a course by elaine ingram on uh, soil microbiology and we're going to start monitoring that with an intern that just came here from wageningen university um, so we are soon purchasing a microscope and we're going to be looking at all the little things going on in the soil. It's really exciting. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. I saw in one of the pictures too, it looked like there was some of the cover crop coming up. Did you notice a pattern that was formed by where the deep ripping was? Can you speak to uh, that? Not, yes, not, not by the deep ripping because there was, um, all of our site was deep ripped. So you yeah. can't really see a difference in that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a small part that wasn't deep ripped, but that's our market garden. So it's difficult to, to yeah. tell the difference. Um, so the biggest difference uh, is really, you really see like a deeper green where the compost was, and that's the mm -hmm. biggest difference that we see. Very cool. Yeah. Have, you been, have you been all right in terms of rain and local climates? Has it been more or less what you expected? We've been so lucky this year. There's been so much rain. It's like a blessing on our project. It's insane. Mm -hmm. there's, there's really been incredible amounts of rain. It rained today again. Uh, at the weekend, we had huge thunderstorms. 
Um, it's a lot colder than it normally is this time of year. So I don't, I can't really um, gauge what that says about climate change here because I, I, I've only been here a year, but um, I think that the climate is definitely different and um, than it's supposed to be, but, but it's working out because it's our first year here and we need all that water. So right. I, th I think it's going to be really That's important. Great news. Yeah. I think it's going to be really important to uh, observe what happens mm -hmm. in the devegetated out, you know, outside the camp area, outside of the restored areas. If there's a difference mm -hmm. um, in temperature and a difference in available moisture in the soil surface mm, yeah and, and at mm. depth Th these these will be hugely i think <clears throat> what you're really proving out there is that people can go and dynamically change the they can rehydrate dehydrated biomes mm. this biome yeah. is dehydrated but it it wasn't. It, there's nothing. When I went there after after coming from China and then going to Spain to look at this, I said, oh, it's easy to fix this compared to the Lis Plateau. Mm. You know, really, really much better situation. So, you know, you, you, I'm expecting some really dramatic stuff from you guys. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No pressure, except we got to heal the planet. Let's do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, or else we're not going to be here long. Oh, yeah. Okay. No pressure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's been a pleasure. And uh, Thanks for having me. And I look forward to more conversations with you in the future. John, thank you so much for everything and for staying up till four in the morning to join us. Amazing. And Kirsten, thank you so much. Our first update from the camp. And uh, let's, yeah, let's do this. Thanks for that report. Let's do this next time, too, huh? Every right. time. Pleasure. Every time. Right. That's it. Every time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll try every time. Well, next time, I just want to say next time we have the Harlands on. Uh, Maddie and Tim Harlan, the, hey. fo the founders of uh, Permaculture Magazine in England, uh, the International. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And um, y'all have a wonderful week. Patrick, anything else to close with? Uh, yeah, just send me the uh, time for that next one so I can put it in my diary and not overbook myself. Okay, will do. Yeah. Maybe All we'll right. Maybe we'll pull you up with one of your questions. You want to take us out with some music, John? Sorry, I'm just noodling now. <laughs> it's wonderful. All right. All right, folks. Well, as John Noodles, we'll bid you a fond farewell. Until next time. And uh, Until next time. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye. Uh,